<laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Bet Online. It remains your number one spot for NBA, MLB, MMA, boxing. It doesn't matter. Every single prop, every single play, every single point, it's all at Bet Online. When it comes to bets, when it comes to props, everything that you need is at your headquarters for sports betting. That's Bet Online. Head to the website right now, use your mobile device, sign up, get a 50, that's 50% welcome bonus. Don't forget to use the promo code. B L E A V, that's believe, to get yourself a 50% welcome bonus. Come on, there's no need to hesitate. Bet online where the game starts. I hope you're ready to have your mind blown with the greatest health and fitness information on the planet. <laughs> Well, hello. You've arrived. How lovely. It's the Mikey Likes You podcast. I am Mikey. Who likes you? Are you? Who is like? What a great, easy, simple equation to understand. First things first, thank you to Bet Online. BetOnline.ag. They have been there since the beginning, making sure that this podcast is a reality. Thank you so much. First attachment makes the absolute best nutritional supplements on the planet. There is everything you need and nothing that you don't. Even the people who make and own First Attachment will be the first to tell you that your training and your diet is the most important thing and you have to get those things in order. But if they are, there are definitely supplements that can help make your goals a reality. Peri-workout nutrition, things to care for your internal organs, fat burners that increase metabolic rate and lipolysis. It's all there for you and it's made by people who know what is good and what isn't what these are not snake oil salesmen. These are actual competitive athletes who know what they're talking about. There is a link in the show notes below. Go get yourself some first attachment supplements. Use the code Mike 10 to make sure you save some money and let them know that you went there because of the Mikey Likesy podcast. All right. So let's move on to what's truly important. And that is today's show topic. It is the top five reasons that I finally got to where I wanted to go with my physique. The reason I wanted to do this podcast is because I work with so many people and I have so many people in my private life, in my, in my everyday life that look to me for advice and they say, hey, you're 44 years old. How do, you, how do I look like you? And it's A, flattering and B, really meaningful because I spent so many, t- so many years making a lot of mistakes, training harder than maybe I've ever trained in my life getting my diet to where I thought it was set and still not getting the results that I wanted to get, that I had in my mind, that I dreamed of. So I isolated five reasons why I was finally able to get over that hump and get to where I wanted to be. Um, I think that these were important for me, again, because there's a, a, a kind of a personal connection because I deal with people who I, act, I genuinely care about, you know, either be it my clients on Patreon, by the way, show a link in the show notes below, or just friends of mine, family members who are stuck, who are frustrated. And I was that guy. And if you're just like, hey, fuck health, fuck fitness, um, that's not who I'm talking about. It's you out there who has it who has the perspective, who has made the decision that they want to change their lives and they want to change the way they look and they want to change the way they feel and you're wondering and you're frustrated because things aren't adding up. Because I was that person. And by using these five main reasons, there were other things, but these five main reasons, I was able to finally get to the point where I saw the results that I was always dreaming of. And that's a really really liberating and satisfying feeling. All right, so let's get into it. Here we go. Reason number one, I prioritized protein and fiber. Okay, everyone knows that if you want to put on muscle, you got to eat the protein, your protein shakes and your steaks and your chicken and blah, 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 blah. Professional bodybuilders are doing this, all this protein. The reality is, is that people grossly underestimate the importance of a protein dominant diet. Regulating your blood sugar and your insulin res- and your insulin release and then subsequently helping your insulin resistance is huge when it comes to regulating body fat and being anabolic when you want to be to build muscle. Okay. 
having your diet be 40% roughly or more of protein, and then also making sure that you're getting a good bolus of dietary fiber is going to keep you full, it is much more satiating. There's a lot more uh, volume to go into your gut with lower levels of caloric intake, and usually it's coming with a higher nutritional value. So you're giving the body more of what it needs with less kind of caloric density. Okay? So prioritize protein. And this goes out to all of you out there who are like, I don't want to be big and huge. No, no, no. In a fat loss phase, higher protein levels are actually more important. When you're concerned with hypertrophy only, you know, a bodybuilder in a bulking phase or an athlete who wants to add muscle mass, the protein levels can actually be a bit lower because you're upping your carbohydrates so considerably. Um, you're going to want that glycogen to fuel these really intense kind of higher volume workouts. When it comes to fat loss, you're going to be dropping carbs and you're going to be dropping fat. Those are your energy cofactors, okay? Um, you're going to need to bring that protein even higher. So regardless of your goal, when it comes to transforming your physique, you need to make sure that protein is super high. Also, you want to have that fiber up in that, you know, 35 grams plus. If you're a bigger person, maybe even higher. Um, because carb sources and plant-based sources that are going to provide high levels of fiber are usually the ones that you want to include in your diet. Again, they're more filling. They're usually more nutrient dense and they're not going to be as quickly and rapidly digested. Okay. And staying regular, by the way, is actually very important when you're having those higher protein levels. Okay. You're going to be wanting to have, um, uh, relaxing and struggle free poopies and do it frequently. Okay. You would want to stay hydrated. Everyone knows that the same goes as far as doing number two, you want to keep things moving in a, in a positive way. All right, let's go on to number two. I talked about prioritizing protein and prioritizing fiber when it comes to nutrition. I started to prioritize resistance training when it came to my training. Anyone who has any familiarity with the Mikey Likes You podcast or anything that I've ever said when it comes to fitness knows that I'm a big, big, I've been just hammering the idea of like, you got to lift weights and you got to lift weights for real. And you got to put in your time and you got to have intensity and you got to have focus when it comes to lifting weights, even if all you're concerned about is losing weight and losing body fat. This notion that if I want to be big and huge, I lift weights. If I want to be leaner, I do lots of cardio. It has to go away. I am not saying that cardio has to be, is completely forbidden. It's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, is that when it comes to training, the number one thing on your mind, regardless of your goal, has to be getting in there and pumping iron and making sure that you're progressing at doing so. More reps and more weight every time you're getting in there. It was really shocking to me when I was able to put my ego behind me and put my preconceived notions behind me and actually start listening to the people who were trying to guide me in the right direction. That when I really tapered down the, the tons of road work, the tons of interval training that I was doing, trying to get leaner, I wanted to have that, you know, Brad Pitt in Fight Club look. And I was like, well, I'm just going to sweat balls nonstop, you know? And then I got into CrossFit before CrossFit was like really a thing. And I just was breaking my ass trying to do all this anaerobic higher kind of, you know, higher intensity work capacity stuff. And, um, I kind of moved away from my connection to weight training. I was clearly weight training, but it was with a different purpose. And it wasn't the linchpin to my training program and things did not add up for me. In fact, they went in a, in a, I went further away from the goals that I had. And when I finally really put cardio on the back burner and even for a long time, just doing zero, um, and focusing on my diet and focusing on my resistance training, that's when things started to add up. My met metabolism came back. I was able to eat more food and stay under my basal metabolic rate. I was able to eat more food and be leaner, which made things so much easier and so much less of a struggle. You know, doesn't that sound better, eating more and still losing weight? 
I'm still losing body fat. Um, and I started to fill out. I never again had that problem of, do you lift, bro? It was never, you know, I was always putting in the time and the effort in the kitchen and in the gym, so I was in good shape and I looked all right when I took my shirt off. But in clothes, no one would think that I spent hours and hours a week in the gym. Once I started to really prioritize uh, my nutrition and then resist heavy resistance training, that's when things started to fall into place and everywhere I went, people could know. There wasn't a question. There was no more, do you, do you lift, bro? People knew. Um, so prioritize resistance training, especially you ladies out there who were listening to this and just letting it flow right through one ear and out the other because you're like, but I don't want to be bulky. Fuck that. That is a bullshit taco wrapped in a fuck off tortilla. If you want to have a lean, beautiful physique, regardless of age, gender, or goal, you have to be prioritizing resistance training. The end. Number three, and this is a big one. I finally understood recovery. I always thought, look, if I'm not sore, I don't necessarily feel that tired. You know what I should do? I should train more. But once I really got into the nitty gritty and really started to commit to understanding recovery, things started to be so much better for me. My results were exponentially better. It wasn't just about your muscles being sore, having this perceived idea that your muscles are ready to be trained again. There's this thing called systemic recovery. And I started to understand management of fatigue and management of all my energy systems. That just because I felt like I could does not mean that I should. I started to really commit to keeping a workout journal, which is a huge part of not only your progress in the gym, but understanding recovery. Because I, I would be like, well, wait, actually, now that I've written down not only this, the amount of weight, the amount of reps, but how it felt, I'm seeing this trend where every time I'm coming in, I'm actually either staying at the same spot or performing worse. I, I, I squatted 315 for seven reps last time. My legs are not sore at all. It was five days ago. I'm squatting. How come I'm squatting 315 for three reps and I barely got the bar up on the third rep? Oh, okay. Uh, I haven't been sleeping very well because I've been working 90 hours a week and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm stressed out of my mind and I, I just haven't really been committing to making sure that I had good pre-workout nutrition, blah, 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 blah. I started to get really, really accountable to myself and subsequently was able to realize the recovery needed both in my skeletal muscular system and in my overall central nervous system. I was able to regulate that, understand it, keep tabs on it so that I could come back every time and keep progressing. Understand recovery. Especially you young people who feel like you're indestructible, you're fucking not. You might be indestructible in the sense that you won't get as hurt as, as, as an old fuck like me. You won't get as hurt as easily as an old fuck like me. You maybe have a little bit more energy coming out of bed even if you had a long night, you know, you partied, blah, 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 blah. But you're not indestructible in the sense that you can't just fuck off and do whatever you want in your free time and then expect to get the results that you want when it comes time to really put your foot on the gas and train and, and eat the meals that you need to eat, okay? Because here's another thing that happens with recovery that people really misunderstand, and I didn't start understanding until about five years ago, and this is a huge component, is that sitting on your ass, just binging Netflix or playing video games is not recovery. That oftentimes, can be a big, 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 big burden when it comes to actually getting the progress that you want. I had to really understand that there are movements that actually enhance recovery. And unless I'm asleep or preparing to be asleep, I can't be sitting on my ass just doing nothing. And that binging 11 shows 
at four seasons apiece is not recovery. In fact, it's actually just shooting myself in the foot. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the fourth big, huge tip because there's a tie in here and that is slowing down my slow and speeding up my fast. I was so consumed with every time I was going to do any type of cardiovascular activity, anything that wasn't resistance training, that I had to go at a certain pace or it wasn't really worth it, that I wasn't going to get that epoch, you know, the, the, or the, the post-exercise, uh, uh, post-exercise oxygen consumption that the people talk about. It's like, well, the interval training or the, I'm going to burn, if I burned 600 calories going eight miles an hour on this treadmill, that's got to be better than burning 300 calories by going four miles an hour. It's got to be better. I'm burning more fuel. And it wasn't because all I was doing was taxing energy systems so that on one end I was taxing it so that when it came time to use the other, I was, it was exhausted and I was hungrier and hungrier with a lower ability to kind of burn fuel and make glycogen be useful for me and make fatty acids get burned so that I could be in lipolysis. Everything was going wrong, but I was working harder because I wouldn't slow down my slow and I wouldn't speed up my speed, my, 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 my fast. And once I started understanding that if I'm going to do intervals, if I'm going to do some type of really high level anaerobic training, it's balls to the wall, balls to the wall, 180 beats per minute heart rate, but really short. I had to learn and understand that there is actually a difference between running fast and sprinting. Sprinting cannot be done for a minute. Sprinting cannot be done for 30 seconds. Sprinting happens in like 10 second maximum intervals. And I had to really learn that and speed my fast up. And I had to learn to slow my slow down and not be in that zone three kind of 160, 155 heart rate beats per minute heart rate thing ever. That when I was doing lots and lots and lots of that stuff, it was actually shooting me in the foot. That's the type of cardio that meatheads talk about when they say cardio destroys your gains. Because cardio won't destroy your gains if you slow down your slow and you speed up your fast. It will absolutely help it. When I slow down my slow, I was walking a lot. I started walking a lot. Sometimes on a treadmill at a really slow pace, sometimes out in my neighborhood, getting outdoors and just staying moving, making sure that I wasn't doing this thing that I thought was recovery by sitting on my ass and getting my meals in and being like one of those guys in wall -E, that when I wasn't working out, even though I worked out intensely every other hour of the day that I was just like, the, I got to rest. I got to rest. That's not fucking recovery. Once I started walking all the time, and doing chores and getting into manual labor and starting to kind of have active hobbies and just keeping myself moving, my recovery was much better and I was kind of slowly trickling away at those calories, keeping my circulation higher without taxing my recovery. In fact, I was enhancing it. Slow down your slow, speed up your fast, okay? Really understand that, yes, if you think that jogging is good, believe me, walking is better. And that running kind of at a medium pace and kind of long distance marathon type stuff is not your best friend when it comes to getting that dream physique. Going for walks, staying active throughout the day with low levels of hiking, rucking, walking, and moving, and doing your house chores, and making sure you take the stairs instead of the elevator, and making sure you park farther away just because, and maybe just going for a walk just for the heck of it, and taking the dogs for a walk because it's nice to get outside and keep moving. Staying constantly active at a low level is exactly what this animal, the Homo sapien, was designed to do, and every once in a while, this apex predator is, decides to go ham and chase down that caribou and stab it and eat it. But the rest of the time, 
We're not just sitting there waiting to be attacked by a tiger. No, we're constantly moving, constantly moving, staying at it. And that's a big reason why the, the greatest athletes in the world right now, the highest levels, have never been hired. There's never been stronger people than the strongest people. There's never been faster people than the fastest people. And there's never been uh, better swimmers than the, better, the best swimmers right now. That's, but the average person walking along the street has never been in worse shape. And there's one reason and one reason alone is that we are constantly so sedentary and our grandparents absolutely were not. And a white collar job was actually really, really rare in 1955 and 1963 and 1975. And progressively got more and more where less and less dudes were out there turning wrenches and, and working in factories and more and more people were sitting behind a computer. And even, look, I, I, we're not going to get into like the semantics of what's right or wrong when it comes to gender science, but more, by far more women did not work. Uh, more women were stay-at-home moms and housewives in previous generations. But that was a whole different thing. That was a whole different thing. Okay? When you don't have modern technology, it was actually, you were kind of on your feet all the time. There wasn't a lot of sitting around eating bonbons like Peg Bundy and watching TV. It was, it was a movement-based kind of endeavor. And, and that is part and parcel to what is good for us, the human being, the homo sapien. Okay, so slow that slow down, but do it a lot. And do it rarely, but speed that speedy up. And finally, the fifth thing that really got me to where I wanted to be Embracing patience. If you're 25% body fat, you can't be in any freaking hurry to see your abs. And I certainly couldn't be in any hurry, literally, like, not even sniff the idea of having single-digit body fat. It's an eternity. And we don't like to hear that. You'll make great progress. You'll make great progress. You'll make great progress. The type of progress where people are like, man, you look great. Oh my gosh, Sally, I can't believe you're the same person. You can make that progress. But if you think you're going to look like, uh, you know, Margot Robbie, if you're a 30% body fat female, that's an eternity. It's, it can happen for you. It absolutely can happen for you. But that's an eternity away. And once you kind of not only accept that, but embrace it and go, yeah, that's right. It may take me a decade. Fuck it. That's who I am. Who do you think you are? And I don't mean that as kind of the trite figure of speech. Literally, who do you think you are? Are you the person that gets overwhelmed with the idea that this may take a decade or more? Or are you the person that says, okay. And so, I'm going to grind today. And I'm going to wake up tomorrow, I'm going to grind tomorrow. And maybe, maybe it does take 10 years. Maybe it takes 10 months. I don't know. All I know is, for today, I'm grinding. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts, tomorrow I'm grinding. And I stop doing the, hey, by this summer, I'm going to look like this. And when I didn't, I would get so frustrated and I'd be like, fuck this. And I would add stress to myself. And then I would, you know, compromise my recovery even more. I would compromise my motivation. So I stopped doing that. I was, I was 40 years old when I started doing that. I mean, this was really recently where I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to look like in summer. All I know is I'm going to go to the gym today and I'm going to train my balls off. And I know that I'm not going to put food in my body that I don't think is good for me and doesn't make me feel good. I know that. So, uh, I'm pretty confident I'll be happy. In three months, I'm pretty confident I'll be happy in three years. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. But uh, I know what I'm doing today. I'm pretty goddamn confident I know what I'm doing tomorrow. That's it. Take, take control of yourself. Take control of your life. Because it's not all about pushing down that gas pedal and just going, going, going. Have an understanding about what you want and why you're doing it. Why are you pushing down that gas pedal? Because if you're just convinced that all you need to do is press the gas without looking at the GPS and entering in the address 
and having some semblance of an idea of how you're going to get there and what traffic may look like, it's going to be a pretty disastrous journey. Who do you think you are? In this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares, remember, I do. Be good.